Well, first, I um, just want to start with um, uh, saying thank you, Carolina, and it's Aruyi, Aruyad, Aruyad, in there for um, for getting us all here, and, and the um, University of De Laguna. Um, I'm going to be sharing information that I actually have not shared with um, with the public and well, since I actually gathered it. And some of the photos you'll see are the first time I'm actually sharing them publicly. Um, thanks to Carolina, I've actually started to uh, go back to the work I did in the 90s. Um, all the photos you've seen are taken with slide film. Um, and I did freelance photography for National Geographic at the time. Um, they provided me with the film and gave it all back. And so I was very lucky to have um, all this equipment um, to gather the data but also um, to start thinking about how, how can I share, but also how can I talk about um, not only the use of fire, but how, how do we contextualize it? How was it used, and when was it used, where was it used? So thanks to having the photographs, I was able to um, share, I'm able to share what I've, I've learned in that time period. But at the end of my talk, I want to share the relevance of uh, what this kind of research can mean for you. Uh, and also mean for um, the local indigenous communities. Um, I am Alaska native. I'm from Kodiak Island, born and raised there. I'm of Sukhbit heritage. Um, and so I would say, Chimai Hui, Hui Gashok Mute, I Nunnagimut, I Kitagimut. Hello, my name is Fish. That's what they call me at home. I am from the village of Old Harbor, from the island of Kodiak, where I was born and raised. I had the privilege to learn, um, live and work with the Amal Nanets. And just to give you an idea of, we were talking about the number of sites that are created annually. Um, I had the privilege to work in 96 and 97 um, with Brigade Number 17. And just to give you a number of sites, um, there, is three, there were three mya, or chums, or teepees, in that campsite. And they created 60 camps a year and over 180 individual campsites. In 1996, in 1997, they had five mya. At 60 campsites, they had created 250 individual sites. And there are 21 brigades in this Yaroselinsky Solfos. So if you calculate the 21 brigades by 60, that's 1,260 camps per year being created just in this one corridor. And then multiply that on an average of, say, five camps, five uh, mya's or chums per camp you get over 6,300 camps being created annually, just in this one area by the Nanet ranger herders. And add that to the complexity, about three quarters of the time they're on top of the snow. And so you have two different campsites, as mentioned before. The difference between the winter and summer campsites are huge. Because with the Nanets, and as I'll talk about, they create their campsites on top of the snow. Once the snow melts, it disperses. So you get a very different camp created by the same group as opposed from winter to summer. And this is what I'll be discussing here. So I had the privilege to live and work with the Yamal Nanets um, reindeer herders. And they are from this area of the, um, Siberia, the Yamal Peninsula here. Um, I was born and raised in Kodiak up here. And here's the Yamal Nanets. And so in 1996, actually 1994, I had the privilege to work with Bill Fitzhugh from the Smithsonian Institution and working with Gazprom and also Amico. And Amico, which is now, I think, um, BP, um, they were not willing to go into this area unless they worked with the indigenous peoples. So they asked Gazprom to set up a collaboration, and Bill Fitzhugh happened to be part of that. Um, doc, working with Dr. William Fitzhugh. And so in 1994 and 95, we did our working with the um, university in Yekaterinburg. Um, we got to go out and do survey work and archaeological work with them um, here at Yarte 6. Um, one of the wonderful things about working in Siberia is you get to work with these lovely things. And these are good days. Um, those are the large mosquitoes. And so while we're doing archaeology, I, I was also at, the, at that point um, interested in doing what I started reading about was this thing called ethnoarchaeology. This is in 96. Um, in my department, nobody, they thought that it was all bogus. It's like, that's not really doing archaeology. Um, so 
working with Bill um, and doing survey work and doing archaeological work, I was interested in trying to figure out, okay, how are these sites being created? What's the landscape like? Who are the people that are living here? Um, I asked the um, ethnographer, hey, what are those, uh, let me see, what are those uh, mounds over there? Or those differences in these, in the landscape? He's like, I don't know, maybe Martians landed there. Because they're perfectly circle and they were all over. But he couldn't explain what they were. He didn't care. It wasn't, wasn't relevant to him. And so we were out doing survey work. And we come around a river bend, and this is what we first saw. This is the first photograph I saw of an Annette's campsite. This is um, a brigade, one of the brigades that um, they left the women and children in one area, and they kept moving with the reindeer. Um, and they were moving every five to 10 days. But with this larger brigade, they're moving every three days. So that was my introduction to the Nanettes. So in 96, I got funding from Geographic and the Smithsonian Institution and then from saving my own money to go out and start doing what I was, what we were now calling ethnoarchaeology. I was interested in trying to understand site formation processes as they were in the process of being, as sites were being created. And so I had no real guidance about what kind of questions I should be asking or what I could be looking at. So I just started, I went out there, I got permission from the collective, um, the Solkhoz, the collective farm in Yaroselinsky, um, and went out. I got support, I went, and originally I was only supposed to spend one week with the camp. Um, because the brigade, um, Andre told me a year later when I was leaving, um, that uh, they had had so many people come into the camp that were, he didn't come out and say it, but were useless because they wouldn't help with all the daily things. And because life is pretty hard out there, you're working from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. And having another person be a burden was really hard. And so they, I was not afraid to chop wood, haul water, and help, help where I could. And so that helped a lot. It allowed me to actually go in. But when you go into a camp or into a new group, you're a child. It doesn't matter how old you are. So you have to understand that that's your worldview um, when you start working with a group and trying to understand this really what seems like chaos when you first go in there, in, into a camp. So when I first went in, I was like, you look at the campsite and you start to ask questions of what's this, what's that. And over a period of time, you start to realize that everything is structured uh, from where the sleds are put to how the tents are set up, the mia'ache in their language. This is called a ngoto sled. And that's on the back side opposite the entrance. And that's to mark the symbolic line called the xiangi line. And that ends up actually influencing a tremendous amount of what happens in each campsite. Um, where fires are put, where men work, where women work. When you go into a campsite, you got the inside. And usually as a guest, what you'll do is you'll be seated right in the center here um, between the host and the hostess. Um, and everything else is very, very structured when you go into these camps. And without knowing that, um, you can make a lot of mistakes. When I first went into that one campsite I showed you where we first photographed, I thought I'd be inconspicuous, and I, I would sit in this area here. So I sat there, and they're all like, Yungu, Yungu, no, 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 you can't sit there. So they moved me over. But um, I found out later that um, this is where the dogs are, and you can see a dog sitting there. But they also um, made the joke that that's where the young women coming to sit would look for, a, for looking for a husband would come and sit. And so I was like, OK, so I made a mistake there. But it's starting to understand that social structure of how the camps are set up. To the first three months, I spent most of my time chopping wood, hauling water, um, and helping move things. Um, and, but I also spent a lot of time observing what the women were doing for their skin sewing. So starting to understand that process, getting in, inculcated into what they were doing on a living basis here, to just uh, watching them scrape skin, um, how the campsites are structured. So I just observed and wrote and took photographs and videotaped. Um, mind you, this is in the 90s before you had so good solar panels um, and everything was film. 
But when you go into a camp, it's very structured. You have the winter chum. Everything's on top of the snow. You've got the floorboards. You've got um, the entryway. You've got a fire stove, as you saw in the uh, last presentation, the previous presentation about these stoves. Um, you have that metal stove there, which is found all across Russia, um, even within the nets. To, as I was interested in looking at, OK, what are they doing and what happens in the wintertime from their campsites? And we're talking about fire, gathering firewood. Where do they gather, gather their firewood? What kind of wood do they gather? Um, and also, how can we learn about, you know, just for this snow melt? You can tell how high um, the snow was where they chopped the tree down. So when you go in there in the summertime, you can actually see the different levels of snow uh, from where they chopped it down. Mostly larch. Um, and you can see that they will take the wood for where, if, whether it's close by or far away. Um, for burning. And what happens in the campsite is all this chopped wood, there's a difference between worked wood and chopped wood, it all happens in the front, near the front entrance. Which it, we'd be like, well, that's common sense. You don't want to have to haul it all around. You get the wood. Um, you want to mainly, mainly find dry wood because um, it burns a lot faster and they burn um, the wood in the campfire, but they have chopped wood that's out in front. And here you have Yana, who's three years old, um, making a fire starter for her aunt to start the fire in the morning. And here's that, that knife. That knife is sharp enough to where you can shave with. And she's three years old. And, um, and you can see her making that. What she'll do is do little shavings um, to get the fire started. And she was doing that early in the morning to help her aunt. Their owls moving with their reindeer. Um, so one of the things that you wouldn't, we wouldn't think about, but as an archaeological site, all those campsites, once they move them, think about all those reindeer trampling it. You know, think about what these reindeer are doing and, and how much impact they have on the sites themselves. The other thing, too, is the reindeer. Um, they have very set rituals for how they're harvesting their reindeer. They won't just kill any reindeer. Um, this one is past its prime, so um, she's, not, she's now not breeding anymore. And they select those out in their mind two, three months ahead of which one's going to be harvested um, in that process. They have it set so that when the reindeer, um, they strangle it. They don't waste any of the blood. But it also falls to its right side um, and has to be facing a north-east-west axis, uh, facing the rising sun. Um, so it has to be facing east, and you have to have it set. And their butchery practices um, are very set, too, in how, how they process the animal to drinking the blood. Because they're above the Arctic Circle, um, they don't have access to vitamins. And they have the story of the scurvy which coming to visit, um, especially when you cook your meat, uh, which they don't usually cook in the wintertime. To the meat where, where it's hung inside the chum, the ma'ache, to um, you guys were talking about getting the bone marrow out. Here's Timofey and his wife, and what they did is they took a jawbone, um, split it, like they were jokingly talking about our wishbone, and then they took the back end of a knife and cracked it, took the marrow out of that. But then they also then took that sharp bone and put it inside the fire, inside the uh, stove, in order to keep their dogs from choking on it. And so the other thing, too, is um, I didn't bathe for two and a half months um, while I was out there. I was only able to stay at three-month increments because of the visa. Um, and so in 96, I spent six months. In 97, I spent seven months by, I, because I got stuck out there for a little bit longer. Um, and I could only stay for half a year at the time. So after getting used to what, watching what the women were doing for their gathering, the, fo the food inside the meow, I started to work with more with the men. And they started to bring me out more because they didn't, they didn't want me to get myself killed because they're working at 30, 40, 50 below weather outside. This is a men's toolkit. And they can use that toolkit to create a, a sled, a nardi, um, within about five days. A good, a good sled maker can do that. And that means knowing what trees to chop down um, and how making sure that uh, you're doing it right. 
Um, one of the things that's important, especially with um, having the opportunity to observe uh, men and women doing traditional things, is, is making sure to pay attention to the details. Like here, Maxime is marking the northern facing side of the tree, and that becomes the bottom of the sled runner. Because it's denser, it's slower growing. Uh, the higher they are in the Arctic because of the cold wind, um, the northern side of the tree is actually slower, so it's denser, and you want that because they're going on the snow and the ground with these sleds. To watching what the elders are teaching them, um, how they're cutting it, um, how they're working with the grain, to talking about the fire pit. We were, you guys were talking earlier about fire not being on the, um, uh, cleaning it out so you can have it on the ground. Um, in this process here, I watched Timofei um, create behind the Miaache, um, in the men's working area, um, a fire pit that was literally on top of the snow. I mean, it burned, eventually burned down to the ground, but it was still, he just lit it on top and it melted the snow as it went um, to bend that larch. And the reason that they would use, they, it didn't burn all the way through is because it's green. And they were going back and forth on it. It took them about two hours to do that process. Um, in this process here, what happened was, um, so they've got to this part, put the sled together, and then Denise, Dennis, um, released this too fast. And you could see that, that that wood split there. So there's a lot of cussing that it went on because it took them about a half a day to get to that process. But by um, releasing it too quickly, um, releasing that, it actually it split that wood. As I mentioned earlier, um, the chopped wood versus worked wood. Um, so you're getting a very different type of uh, materials on either side of the um, chum, biache. So you see this worked wood, it's long slivers, not chopped small chunks. Um, so you're getting a very different type of wood that's being worked. Um, with Maxime here, he was telling me about the different parts of the reindeer. There are owls moving. Um, here, um, Alexander is actually lassoing a young reindeer, and what they'll do is they'll cut the ears for showing ownership marks in the reindeer. Uh, they're herding about 4,000 head of reindeer. So when you get them moving, they have 10 dogs that help them, four men, two up front and two behind. Um, they make a sound kind of, ho, 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 ho. You say that, and all the reindeer will come together. It sounds like a wolf to the reindeer. And that's your view most of the time. Um, and they're using a tour, again, a larch. Um, and you tap the reindeer to keep them moving. And it doesn't matter. He's, he's got two layers of, or actually three layers of clothing on. Um, this is called a gusha. And this, the temperature went from minus 25 to 35 below within an hour. And that's as far as my temperature gauge would go. So winter campsites on top of the snow. This is um, right in the spring, early springtime, or yeah, springtime. So what I did is I photographed, recorded, documented, and then tried to map out as much as possible what was happening on top of the snow. So you see the fire where they dumped the fire, um, the charcoal, from where the original campsite was. And, and each family had their own pattern of doing this. A lot of times they would mark it, um, dump the fire, the ash, to the... Um, uh, the, in the sacred area where the campsite is, because if you look at the way the floorboards are laid out, the fire would have been there, the entry would have been there, and then they would dump it in the front. Um, this one here, they dumped it off to the right where nobody was living um, when they moved. And again, you can see that same process, the kids watching um, as they're dumping the ash out of the stove. So in the wintertime, you get charcoal stains and scattered ash remains, um, trying to understand you know, what was there. And again, just to show you um, and to reiterate that sharp point of burning the bone um, in order to, so that the dogs don't choke, um, they would put the, the bone in the fire and burn it. Um, so in, time, in the winter campsites, what you saw was um, in that front where the women are doing the chopping of the wood, you've got the campsite is set up and then the men doing the work in the back. And so you're getting, even in every campsite, a gender differentiation uh, um, on how the campsite is set up and where the fires are, where the fire, fire pits are put in this situation. And I, was, I had the privilege to 
participate and observe over 52 lived campsites and document over 200 um, abandoned campsites um, in the work I did in the research I was doing. So the winter campsites, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing to be out there. Um, and this is where I was at with Brigade Number 17. Um, all the red dots are places I actually visited. The, the green dots I had Andre mark um, the map to show exactly where they went because I couldn't stay any longer um, in the camp. And so I mapped all those out, photographed them and videotaped. Um, so I have all that data. But what about the summertime? And I do this to, I throw, I throw this in to throw you guys off a little bit. What is this? I'm above the Arctic Circle. There are no penguins in the Arctic. <laughs> this photograph was sent to me by a friend of mine, um, Maria Stenzel from National Geographic. And she was going down to South Georgia Island. And they transplanted reindeer in South Georgia Island for the explorers uh, so they would have food. And the reindeer that survived on South Georgia Island are small. And so I said, hey, can you send me photographs of the reindeer? Because I was working with reindeer herd herders. And so she sent me this, and so I put that in there. And I love to do this with kids because they're like, wait a minute, there's no penguins in the Arctic. I'm trying to give some light to uh, something serious. So the summertime, um, at the time I was there, they were um, selling the antler, the ponty, to the Koreans. And the Koreans are using that as an aphrodisiac. So there was a, a large amount of money coming in to the Nanettes. And so what was happening is I, I was there just as things were starting to also change. Um, because they have more access to money, they're able to buy snow machines. Um, and so I haven't talked to them since um, about that process yet. But the summer campsites, as archaeologists, what we're getting created now are house floors. Now we can actually see who these people are, or see remnants of their sites. You got camp, you got the chopped wood again, where the women are doing their work uh, for chopping up the firewood. The men doing the work in the back of the camp. Um, and also, I just wanted to make sure to mark, um, make a note of this is, um, in their transition camp between winter and summer camp, that was the only one they'll actually go back to every year uh, for the Nanettes, because that ends up being where they store their winter gear versus their summer gear. But in the other campsites, they'll move to a different spot, different place every year. Um, but one of the things that the Nanettes, at least that they told me, was they would never set up their tomb or their fire pit in the same fire pit as the previous year or other fire pits. It's just a taboo that they spoke, an unspoken taboo. They don't have access to about to the outside world for several months. So what they'll do is they'll buy bread from the towns, slice it, and then dry it, and then store it in their, um, their sleds here to, again, just hours packing wood, moving, carrying, going and gathering. Um, here they're gathering local willow. Um, on the sides of the, near the lakes in the rivering areas. One of the things that I also need to mention too is um, the Yamal is sitting on one of Russia's largest gas reserves. It's about a quarter of Russia's large um, re gas reserves. So when I was there, um, they were in the process of building a railway, um, railway, a railroad up to the center of the Yamal and they finished that. Um, and that's now controlled by Gazprom. To being habituated into this process of um, chopping wood. Um, here she's two and a half years old. I watched her come, come out and she could see she's tied down. So she, um, the reason they tied her down is so she didn't run off and get trampled by reindeer. Um, so while I was watching the, um, them har move their reindeer, I turned around and saw this little kid come out, drag a piece of wood in and come out, pick up the ax and go inside. And when I peeked in there, she was chopping wood. And I told her mom, she's like, oh, she's fine. Um, nowadays, we'd be like, oh my god, no. <laughs> to inside the tomb, they're now creating fire pits instead of using fire camp stoves. So now you've got a fire pit along with them creating a house floor where they're living. So that changes what you find in the archaeological record in the summer campsite. Um, again, same process, same wood, wood, worked wood versus chopped wood. I was working. Um, here what she's doing is making sinew uh, from the reindeer for sewing. 
to, again, just documenting that process. And so I have over 15,000 slides, um, and I was photographing um, the details of you know, campsites and all that in order to understand what we're looking at. Here, Maxime is going out with his dog, Carlos, and he has a shotgun, and they'll, they'll bring back birds, um, harvesting, white-winged scooter. Summertime, they fish, and the reason they are fishing is because they don't harvest their reindeer because he's bought flies. Um, um, these flies burrow their way out of the skin, and so the skin's useless to use, and they don't want to waste their skins. Reindeer are too precious to them. This is their money. Um, when I was working with the Serreteta clan, they had over a thousand head of reindeer that, for their own. Um, during the Soviet period, which is kind of surprising because this is in 96, 97, um, the Soviet Union had collapsed in, collapsed in 91. Um, and so it was interesting to have them have so many head of reindeer as private as their own. But what they would do is they would give them so many reindeer per year. And so the Sarateta clan actually ended up having to accumulate, um, and this family accumulate over a thousand head of reindeer by that time. And I don't know what the economy is now. But summer campsites, again, very different from winter campsites. But um, how these campsites are set up, again, you get the men's work area, women's work area. And as I mentioned briefly, and, it, and there's I can go into ad nauseum on this. When you set up a campsite, they set up this called a simsipo, which is um, women are not allowed to do a full circle around the, the camp. It brings them bad luck. Women are not allowed to step over a, a tour, the, the driving for the reindeer. They're not allowed to step over a line. Um, they have very set rituals when that happens to cleanse themselves. They burn um, a beaver fur if they have it and then they have a, a smoking cleansal, cleansing. But it's, a la, it's, it's done so that they don't bring bad luck, but also what ends up happening is that that symbolic line goes out of sight into camp, and they say to infinity, but once you get outside of the camp, you can go this way, but you have to come back the same direction you went. You cannot do a full circle. And I asked about the men, the men were like, ah, we can go anywhere we want. Um, but observing the men, they didn't try to do a full circle either. Um, they also tried to avoid that, that same thing without thinking about it. Um, and so I watched um, Antonina. There was a dog that did something, and she came out yelling at the dog, and the dog ran around the tomb and over to this way. She went there and then stopped. Um, she wouldn't cross that line, that symbolic line in that campsite. And it was interesting because I was watching Sasha observe her, and he's like, oh, that's good. He didn't, she didn't bring bad luck to the camp. But um, uh, what's interesting, I mean, it's interesting, but it also affects how these sites were created in that process. So as an archaeologist, we can start to see, um, start to actually learn and ask different questions. So to test this, I went out with Eric Hudi, um, and the, his, dad, his family is actually a hunter-fisher campsite. And the hunter-fisher campsites are very different. Same culture, same group, same structure. But the campsites are more complicated because they're staying in one area for three to five months. And I watched them in the three weeks I was there, I watched them move from one area to another. And I was asking, why did you guys do that? And the mom was like, well, our house floor was getting dirty. What do you mean dirty? It's getting dusty. It's drying out. So they move from one area to another about two or three meters over. So at the end of several months, you'll have one family that created multiple sites, multiple campsites, at the same time in the same, same year, all because they were like, our campsite was getting dirty. That adds that another level of complexity, because if you did not, if I didn't say that, you look, oh, there's a fire pit here, fire pit here. Oh, there was seven people here, seven families. Actually, no, it was one family that created all of these just in one area. Um, and add the children to it. Um, these guys are probably the most destructive to our archaeological sites. Because <laughs> they, um, they'll do things that you're like, well, wait, this, this, what is this? And then you're like, oh, no, we're just playing. Um, when I was first surveying in 94, we came around and we were looking at the site, and there was a big pile of rocks. 
This is all lowest deposit in this area. And I asked the ethnographer we were working with, Andre, and he's like, I was like, what is that? And he's like, oh, it's probably something sacred. You know, they might have been giving thanks to something. I was like, okay, make, mark that note. Three years later, I'm at another summer camp site, and I come out in the morning. The kids had gathered all the rocks they could find and piled them into this little pyramid. And I was like, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're just playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just kids playing, but at the same time, they're, they're the ones who make things more complicated. So what I did is to test and show the difference between the winter and summer campsite. I went out and mapped out these live campsites. And one of the things that I learned too is these bottles of vodka or the center where they would leave, um, when they would leave a camp, they would leave their bottles, empty bottles of vodka there. And up until a certain point, they, they, um, the bottles of vodka had the date stamped on them. So you can actually get approximate dates for when these um, campsites were occupied. So I mapped them out. Um, you know, just going in and doing just winter campsites, summer campsites, what's the difference? What can we see um, as, as in terms of um, how things are left behind? And so you can see I took the GPS markers and all that so that when I go back, I can actually go back and look at um, what the sites look like today or if you can see anything um, to, to understand the processes as an archaeologist. And so I went to the Yurube River um, to do in 96 and 97. Um, and these are all the different campsites I mapped out in that process, in that time period. Um, we ended up getting stuck in, I think it was 97, um, an extra two and a half weeks um, because the, uh, the guy who promised to pick us up um, on a helicopter didn't come back. And so we ended up taking, I ended up catching a, a helicopter that was taking kids back to boarding schools in that time period. And all these dots are the places I had the privilege to visit. Um, doing archaeology with Bill Fitzhugh and the University of Kettenberg. Um, survey work up here. Uh, survey work along the um, river there and the Yurube River. And then working with the um, brigade and then just doing um, uh, a boat visit um, into another area. So those are all the places I had the privilege to go and, and observe and document to try to understand um, the Yamal. But there's another level that with the Nanets, they have a lived landscape. Um, here is, this is a research um, done by a Nanets talking about all the sacred sites. And that adds a whole nother complexity to how they actually move around their, their, uh, in the Yamal. To what does it mean for the kids? Um, you know, why why are we doing this kind of research? Um, how is it relevant? Uh, while we're doing, while I was understanding how fire was used or how the campsites were created, um, I was also interested in how is it relevant to the Nanets? How can they actually use this data for for themselves in the future if they ever wanted to? Um, so working with Okateta. Um, I tried to think about how I can make my own research relevant for, for them uh, by documenting these archaeological sites, by showing that you know, you've got thousands and thousands of sites. This entire area is being used by the Nanets. But yet when you go there, there's nothing there. It just looks like flat tundra without knowing about the differences in fire pits, the difference in um, winter summer campsites. Um, you can gloss over and just say, oh, nobody's here, so we can use it. We can take over. Um, so when I did my work, I tried to figure out how they can use this in terms of, um, I want to say land claims, but they can show the outside world that, hey, there, are, there is research that actually shows we use this land. Um, while our mark is 1,000 years is, what, 20 centimeters maybe? You're dealing with microstratigraphy. The kind of questions we can ask from what we've learned from living with them as archaeologists, um, we got a deeper, a deeper understanding of how to understand the Nanets themselves and this, um, the complexities of these sites. So the reason I'm only now able to come back to this is I took a position three years ago at the University of Washington. For 14 years, I went back to my village, my community, uh, from where I was in Kodiak, and I ran a museum. 
So I was an administrator. So I took a totally different turn after I finished my PhD of working with reindeer herders. Um, and now I'm able to come back, and thanks to Carolina, I'm now asking, going back to my data and starting to think about how can I ask how fire was situated within the NNS? How can I explain that to us as archaeologists so we can use this data in how we start to interpret better what we're looking at? Um, so I'm in the process of working on that. But what I learned from this experience and what I took from this experience is there's a living culture, living language, beliefs, heritage, all pass on in a living context. Where I came from in Alaska, our language was nearly gone. Our traditional ways were being su continually suppressed. Um, and um, who we were, we were made to feel ashamed of. I grew up feeling ashamed of who I was because of my skin color, because of me being native. We were told we were nothing but dumb, drunk natives by the outside world. Here, when I went home, we have 7,500 years of history. Um, in the last 200 years, almost all of that was erased. Today, we only have 10 fluent speakers left of our language. So we're struggling to keep our language alive. But my experience in the Yamal for 13 years working with the Aleutic Museum in Kodiak, we were able to use what I learned from working with the Nanets to say, hey, we have all this archaeological evidence. We have this ethnographic material. How do we take and put it back into a living context? How can I use what I talked about with the Nanets and apply it in a living context? Uh, no, with my own tribe, but with others as well. And so I had the privilege to, to create programs that allowed us to take archaeological material and ethnographic material to show the traditions of mask carving, games, skin sewing, bent wood bowls, weaving, uh, show the value of it, to take away this attitude of, oh, you guys are just dumb, primitive savages, to show um, how complex our cultures really were to show the value of even petroglyphs, working with them, to you know, mapping them out, and trying to understand the stories that were lost. And this is something across North America, Canada, Alaska, Mexico, I mean, all of it. All of this data has been stripped away. And all the research that you have done as anthropologists, and all our ancestors as anthropologists have done, that data is important for us as indigenous peoples because it helps us reestablish who we are and who we were, but it also shows the outside world the value of our knowledge, the value of, instead of just trying to push us aside, the value of, hey, how do we work with them? How do we collaborate, not consult, collaborate? To one of the projects I worked with at the University of Washington, um, one of the first projects I worked with, this boat disappeared from our, our lived knowledge. By 1860s, it's gone. It was destroyed, erased by the Russians. Well, there's 13 models. How can we bring that knowledge back into it? How can we use archaeological data to learn from? How can we put it back into a living context? 2014, the first 13 models built since 1860s on Kodiak. That's, that's fine, yeah. Let's take it to another level. In 2015, why don't we just build a full-size full one from the 1860s? In a week's time, we built a 16-foot Anyak. To, at the Burke, we built a 27-foot one. And we tested it, sailed it. So we took data that was got lost. And this last summer, we built the, the finish at Anyak. We learned how to do the traditional sewing based on the ethnographic collections. We looked at this bow, this bulbous bow, which um, I look at and is pretty amazing. It took computers and billions of dollars probably to design this on our boats today. My ancestors had that for over 1,000 years. How primitive, how stupid is that? 
So one of the things that um, I ask, so what does it mean? So when you're doing your research and analysis of all this data, how can you make it relevant for the communities you're working with? And I think one of us, what we do is important, but we need to be better salesmen to show the value to our society of what we're doing so that we have relevance, we're showing the relevance. And this is why I was asked, how can, you, how can we, you, is archaeology, uh, use archaeology to help change our present from the past and into the future? We study the past, but we're also influencing the future based on what we learn. And you know, so for me, I, I work towards repatriation of knowledge, not just the objects. And, and try, I try to say, you know, for museum collections and archaeological collections, for us as indigenous peoples, they're living. They're living because of the knowledge embodied within each of these pieces. And its collections become relevant and important in our communities and how we learn about it and share them. How we share them as archaeologists. And then that knowledge of, of, of how past and present knowledge is and can still be seen as living. And so I say this in terms of our responsibility, our heritage, our future. I mean ours in a global sense. We all have to take the responsibility to care for our world. I traveled halfway across the world to share this message. But this is something that I think all of you should instill into your students and so on and so forth. To show that value so that when you are working with your students, they can then start to understand the context of what we have in front of us. Uh, one of the things I try to teach and take that, the, the, where I, my own journey with the Nanettes to working with my own tribe to now teaching at a university level is how do I work with the students so that they can understand going from a piece of wood to a bow, that process, and the residues that are left behind in that process so that they can become better interpreters of the past. So think about the context of what you're digging up and the relevance it has to the communities you're working with. Thank you. <laughs>